Hello again, Fight Fans. Welcome to episode number 181 of the Neutral Corner Podcast. I am your host, Michael Montero, for Boxing Monthly Magazine and BoxingMonthly.com. Guys, before we get into news and notes, I want to give you a quick few reminders. First of all, smash the like button. Pow! Go ahead and hit it, guys. Hit that like button. And, um, of course, we have Super Chat here on the YouTube Live. Uh, we also have a Patreon page. You can find that. It's just Montero Unboxing. Everything's Montero Unboxing. Every platform that we're on, that is the handle. If you'd like to tip the show, you can do it live here right now on Super Chat. If you want to tip the show later on, please hit us up on Patreon. And um, also, your fee for this week. Now, look, I don't charge a monetary fee for any of this. Of course, I love it if you guys could help me out monetarily. We put it all back into the channel. But... I charge a fee that is homework. It is an action. And what I ask for you guys to do this week is make sure you're following me on Twitter. Now, why do I say that? Because we are getting close to having 7,000 followers on Twitter. And it's just a milestone. We just hit 8,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel about a week ago. I want to hit that 7,000 on Twitter. And I know a lot of you guys out there already follow me. Some of you may think you're following me. Go double check. Give me a follow on Twitter. And if you are on Twitter, you already follow me, man, spread the word. I know that you guys a lot of times will tweet out stuff, um, you know, uh, best podcast to listen to, best follows on Twitter. Give me a best follow on Twitter post, tweet this week. When you do your best boxing follows on Twitter, just include me in that, okay? Definitely uh, get my Twitter out there. Uh, Hamed is asking, you need to follow, or he's saying you need to follow back. Uh, guys, I try to follow back. I, don't, I can't check my notifications every three seconds. I, I, when I see you guys follow, I try to follow back. But literally, when it's thousands of people, it, it's, it's difficult to follow everybody back. But those of you who I chat with a lot on Twitter, I end up following you. I don't always know if I follow you back or not. But those of you who are active with me and we chat on Twitter every day, you know I follow you. So, um, yeah, I'm not one of those guys that's going to be like, follow for follow. I'm not that kind of guy. And honestly, again, I can't keep track of all of it. And the notifications are nuts for me already. And I have just under 7,000 followers. I'm, th- I'm following maybe 1,000 or so. So anyway, please give me a follow and spread the word about me. And um, if we chat a lot on Twitter, I absolutely will give you a follow back. It's not that I'm, I'm against it, okay? I just don't always remember to do that. So that is your fee for this week. Also, I wanted to ask, are you guys interested? I've, you know... I do my Q&A videos occasionally. I haven't done one in a while. A couple of you guys have asked about doing another Q&A video. They're always fun. But Tiffany, my fiance, my lovely, talented, gorgeous fiance, had an idea of doing a tipsy Q&A. What would you guys think about that? With her included, me and her sitting down at the table, having some drinks and doing a live Q&A with you guys. And you can watch us drink together and answer your questions. Does that sound like something fun or does it sound like something that could be a complete catastrophe? <laughs> Let me know what you think. So this is TNC episode 181 for Saturday, August 3rd. We are about to hit August already. Holy shit, this year is flying by. Let's get into some quick news and notes. Uh, first, boxers behaving badly. Uh, Jesse Benavides, remember him. He was last uh, seen last October losing to Terrence Crawford. No shame in that. His first professional loss. Hasn't done dick since then. Well, now I guess we know what he's been up to a little bit. He's been street racing. He's been doing a little Fast and the Furious. And he was arrested for street racing in Arizona recently. That's never good. But that's going to be a slap on the wrist and a fine. But Dillian White, test positive for metabolites, traces of a banned substance, Dianabol, which is a, an anabolic steroid. Uh, so this was a, a sample and a test conducted by UCAD, UK Anti-Doping. And this was before, I, apparently, the sample and the test, everything was done three days before his fight with Oscar Rivas. There was a meeting, and it was determined that he could go forward with his fight with Rivas. There's some... Um, some controversy about that. There's a lot of people, understandably, upset about that, particularly Oscar Rivas and his team. And even the WBC, I don't think, were notified. I know for sure Oscar Rivas wasn't notified. Their fight, White and, and Rivas, that, that was for 
WBC uh, mandatory position or whatever. And once they bump up Deontay Wilder to franchise champion, this is basically for what will become the WBC title or maybe interim title at some point. So uh, they're pissed off that they weren't notified. And of course, Oscar Rivas is pissed off that he wasn't notified. So a lot of people are confused between, because they heard, well, he was doing VADA testing and UCAD testing. And if VADA's so good, why didn't he test positive on VADA's test? And how did he pop on the UCAD test but not the VADA test? And, and why wasn't Rivas made aware? So, guys, I've already decided because I feel like every week I have to explain the difference. I'm going to make a video. And let me know if you're interested in this. But I think I'm pretty sure I want to do a video. Uh, the numbers behind the WBC clean boxing program and how it stacks up, because I don't think you guys understand how well over 90% of the fighters enrolled in the program are never tested. And very few, when they are tested, is it even really a meaningful test? That's not a slight on VADA. It's more of a slight on the WBC for not properly funding the program. It would take millions more dollars that have been that they're being put into the program to properly test all 255 top 15 rated fighters in the 17 divisions in pro boxing okay the numbers are astronomical and i'll break it all down for you guys in a video let me know if you'd be interested in that so i'm not even going to get into the vada aspect he's dillian white's enrolled in the vada clean i shouldn't say vada the wbc clean boxing program it is not the same thing as being enrolled in vada testing and for eddie hearn to say that and I know, i've noticed a lot of promoters and, and managers and advisors saying that recently, my fighters enrolled in VADA testing when they're really not. They're in the WBC clean boxing program. It's completely different. Disingenuous, and I feel that they're purposely conflating it to confuse fans, but I'll do that in a separate video. However, UCAD, when they run a test, when they collect a sample, process a test, and there's an abnormality found, they have an adjudication process that is long and drawn out with the BBBFC. That's the British Boxing Control Board. British Boxing Board of Control, something like that. Um, and they have to go through their whole process of adjudication. That's a fun word to say, adjudication. It basically, what it means, it's just a process of, figure, of investigating and getting to the bottom of what happened. Was this... Uh, did this abnormality in, in that came from this sample, this test sample, was it from something purposely ingested or accidentally being ingested? What happened? Until that whole adjudication process is done, the fighter can still fight. What I don't like, I don't mind that. I don't love it. But what if you're going to go that route, which I wouldn't, but if you're going to go that route, if you're the BBB of C and UCAD, at least let the damn opponent know. At least let the sanctioning organization know. I think that's a shitty situation and it's a shitty process. And that's why I've been saying on Twitter all week, UCAD's process sucks. And it's another thing that a lot of people in the boxing media simply don't do the, uh, the work to understand how that process works. They, they don't ask questions and they don't do the reading and the discussions necessary to figure out all this stuff. But guys, go back to 2015 with Tyson Fury when he tested positive for a banned substance, a steroid, I believe, an anabolic, early in 2015. No one's made aware of it. Only Tyson Fury and the BBBFC and UCAD know. He ends up fighting Vladimir Klitschko later that year. After that fight, it all comes out that Tyson Fury failed a test. There was no drug testing for his fight with Vladimir Klitschko. Klitschko's infuriated. He had the rematch clause in his contract, and he stated that, look, you're contractually obligated to do this rematch with me immediately. We're going right into it. And uh, if you're going to do it, we're going to do it. I want VADA testing. I want to do true VADA testing, not the WBC clean boxing program. This is before that was even around. I want full VADA testing. And then we saw what happened there with Tyson Fury. Me playing amateur psychologist i think he self-sabotaged that rematch from happening because he knew what he was going up against i favored vladimir klitschko in that rematch but anyway had klitschko known tyson fury's history that fight with him and fury wouldn't have happened unless fury had signed on for advanced vada testing klitschko would have demanded it like he did in the rematch further the ibf made him their mandatory the ibf probably wouldn't have made him their mandatory 
had he tested, had they known that he had tested positive for an anabolic earlier that year. So the fight between Klitschko and Fury may have never even happened. And if it did happen, there would have been advanced testing for it. So this process with the BBBFC and UCAD is a broken process. It's shit. And if I am any fighter from any other part of the world traveling to the UK to fight over there, I am demanding both fighters enroll in legitimate VADA testing. Not the clean boxing program. I'm talking about actual VADA testing. What Anthony Joshua and Jarrell Big Baby Miller did. What, uh, what Jarrett Hurd and Julian J. Rock Williams did. That's what I'm talking about. I would demand that. I would not trust UCAD. And I'm not beating up on the UK here. I don't trust USADA. Right? And USADA is an American testing authority. And USADA tries to look through their name and everything like they're a government agency. They're not. They're a, they're a for-profit company that does very well. Their bottom line is very, very good. Okay? They're not somebody like Vada who's doing it making no money. And they're not UCAD, which is actually a government authority. So, look, I'm not just trying to beat up on the UK. I have major issues with USADA, and I could rant on them. But UCAD's process sucks. So when certain promoters over in the UK, mainly Eddie Hearn and Matchroom, but also Frank Warren's pulled this shit too, say, my fighter's being tested with UCAD. It's a great process. You, you can trust what's going on here. I'm not trying to throw shade or whatever, but UCAD sucks. And if you're about to fight a guy who's doing UCAD, for all you know, he tested positive for eight different drugs. You're not going to know until a year later after their adjudication process. So that's a busted system and it sucks. Azier says UFC uses USADA at Shady. Yes, it, do, it does not surprise me one iota that UFC signed with USADA. They are not interested in cleaning up the major, major doping issues in that sport that dwarf the dwarfing issues in boxing. And don't take my word for it. I've been told this by former MMA fighters. I've been told this by multiple state athletic commission officials and anti-doping officials. It's a much worse problem over there. You see why they signed with USADA. They're paying more money to do their testing through USADA. They could save money and get superior testing through VADA. And you see what they did. Okay, a couple other quick news and note items here. Pacquiao Thurman announced attendance for that fight was 14,356. However, the real attendance in terms of tickets sold per the Nevada State Athletic Commission report, 11,436 tickets. So for whatever reason, everybody advance or uh, exaggerates the, their attendance numbers. Just about everybody. It's, it's odd. I don't quite understand it. Uh, the true attendance was 14.3 thousand, but 3,000 of those were comps and gimmies. 11.4 thousand paid for tickets. Either way, really successful show. Did about half a million pay-per-view buys, which is pretty much right around where we thought it would. Some people were saying it'll do 800,000 buys. No, that doesn't happen anymore unless it's a super crazy mainstream type of event that crosses over. It's going to take Mayweather Pacquiao 2 or a, a Mayweather or Pacquiao, somebody like that fighting a UFC guy to do a million plus buys. Although, well, I was going to say Triple G and Golovkin 3 could break a million, but they're on the zone. It's not pay-per-view. Anyway, a gate of our $6 million. So a very successful show. And then, of course, there's all the foreign TV money and stuff and all that for uh, on Pacquiao's end. So he did very, very well. One last item here. The WBO has ordered Oscar Valdez fight Shakur Stevenson. Now, they haven't been able to come to a deal. So a purse bid is set for Friday. Let's see if that purse bid actually goes through. The WBO has delayed several purse bids related to several fights in recent times. I want to see if they push this. That's an interesting fight. It's a very, very interesting fight. So um, I'd like to see it. And Stevenson... He's as ready as he's going to be in the next few years for somebody like Valdez. Valdez, top-level fighter, not pound for pound, but a top-level fighter. And just style-wise, that could be a hell of a matchup, man. All right, let's get into the review, guys. And then um, quick reminder, please smash the like button. And please let me know what you guys would think about a tipsy Q&A video with Tiffany Lamb, my fiance, and myself, if you guys would be interested in that. And also, spread the word about my Twitter page. I need about 100 or so Twitter followers this week to get me up over 7,000. So please, please uh, get on that. I just saw a comment there from L.R. Chiga. 
saying Jamel Herring told me personally that Burchell doesn't want to fight him. He's fighting Lamont Roach right now. Yeah, you know what? Since I just wrapped up news and notes, let me go ahead and, and uh, talk about that. You guys know if, if you have the last issue of Ring Magazine, I, um, I talked to Jamel Herring. Uh, I did an interview for him and it was in that issue, right? You guys who subscribe to the magazine, you read my article on Jamel Herring. And uh, I talked to him for a, an hour or so. It was actually a really good chat. He's pretty awesome. Great guy. Just a super great guy. And I'm not just saying that because he's a former Marine like myself. He's just an awesome human being. I like Jamel Herring a lot. But we talked about the Miguel Burchelt thing. It's not Burchelt per se. It's his team. They really thought Herring was going to lose that fight against the Japanese fighter, and they were going to go up against Ito. And they were really comfortable with that style. They took, the, they took a look at Herring's fighting style and how good he looks at 130 right now, and they said, you know what? Yeah, we're going to pass. So uh, Burchell and his team, they have no interest in fighting Jamel Herring. Not happening. And Lamont Roach, I believe, was the number one rated contender, so he was going to have to fight him anyway. And that is a fight between uh, promotion between Top Rank and Golden Boy. They get along. So I believe it's Golden Boy that represents Lamont Roach. So it works out. And I think Golden Boy realizes Roach, this is probably the height he's going to get to. There's no more development there. It's shit or get off the pot time for him. So that fight's going to happen later this year. I think October. All right, guys. uh, Review time. Last Saturday, July 27th, we had a bunch of fights here in the U.S. of A. Let's start on the East Coast at Royal Farms Arena in Baltimore. PBC on Showtime. This was TGB and Mayweather Promotions working together. In the main event, Gervonta Davis improves to 22-0 with 20 knockouts, scoring a TKO2 win over Panamanian Ricardo Nunez. For Nunez, nice, shiny, sparkly record, 21-2. Looked real good. He was mandatory, apparently. But this was his first fight in the USA, and he had fought absolutely nobody to be in a mandatory fight. So a lot of people didn't like this stoppage. The referee is, was Harvey Dock, who I think is one of the top five referees in the sport, an up-and-coming rep. I like Harvey Dock a lot. I think he does a very, very good job. Me, personally, I didn't mind this stoppage. Given the tragedies that we've seen recently, given the fact that this was a complete mismatch, given the fact that Nunez had no business being in a title fight and headlining a Showtime Championship boxing card with Gervonta Davis, I could give a flying fuck that this was stopped a tad early by Harvey Dock in the second round. Did you guys think Nunez was going to win? Did you think he had a chance to win? It wasn't going to last very long. I'm surprised it went to the second round, to be honest with you. So Nunez, you look at his record, it's crap. It's domestic level opposition. Showtime in the promotion tried to pump him up like he was this really worthy opponent. He wasn't. And you saw what happened in the fight. Look, the shot that he got caught with, he was showboating. He was, you know, getting lackadaisical. Gervonta Davis pounced on him. That was it. But when he got clipped on the ropes, guys, he looked pretty bad. He looked pretty bad. I saw no problem with the stoppage. Anyway, Gervonta Davis, Tank Davis. Resume is pretty thin. Has a couple of good wins. His best win right now was a drained Jose Pedraza, who moved up in weight right after that. And has looked much better at 135. Apparently, there are over 14,000 fans in attendance. Now, again, let's assume that three, 4,000 of those are gimmies, which they probably were. Still, 14,000-plus people in Baltimore showed up to watch Gervonta Davis, a kid who weighs 130 pounds, fight some guy from Panama, right? I say some guy, not to disrespect him. I'm saying what most casual sports fans in Baltimore think when they see the, the name Ricardo Nunez. So that's an, that is an accomplishment. It means that Javante Davis is a brand in his hometown. Does it mean he's a superstar in boxing? Does it mean he's a pay-per-view star, as his promoter Floyd Mayweather says? No, it doesn't. In some of the hyperbole coming from Leonard Ellaby and Floyd Mayweather about this kid, look, they're promoting him. I understand that's part of the job. But there are people in the quote-unquote new media just basically echoing at LRB's sentiments that Javante Davis is this massive superstar. He's not. And he, he has potential. There's a tr- tremendous potential. He's an exciting fighter. Tremendous potential. 
but he hasn't faced the best fighters in his own damn division yet. There are other titleists at 130 right now. Let's see. We've got Herring, who I just talked about, WBO title. Tevin Farmer, who I'll talk about in a second. Uh, Davis himself and Andrew Conciao both have a piece of the WBA. And then you got Miguel Burchelt. So he hasn't faced anybody on that level. Until he does, you can't call the guy a star, right? Now, we just saw a star be born in Dallas. I'll talk about that in a second. When Ramirez beat Hooker, that was a star-making performance. That was one guy fighting another elite guy in his division. Tank Davis hasn't done that yet. Oh, we got a super chat from Rex Righteous One. Thank you very much. Rex, thank you very much. Uh, Ask, why is it okay for Tank to walk around with the IBF? Are you talking about the IBF title? I guess, does he have a piece of it? Does he have, guys, I don't even know. As far as I know, he just has the WBA title. Rex, you're going to have to give me a little more detail on that because let me look here. I'll, I'll pull it up right here on my laptop. Javante Davis. I want to see because to my knowledge, he just has a piece of the WBA, but I want to make sure that I'm saying it right here. Yeah, right now, Javante Davis is the WBA super world super feather champion. So uh, Rex, you got to give me more on that. Walking around with the IBF, I'm not quite sure what you mean, brother. Um, I think he did have an IBF title before. Let me go back and see. Yes, you know what, Rex? I just answered my own question. He had the w- he had the IBF title at 130. That's the title he lost on the scale. So he still goes around carrying that title because in his mind, he didn't lose it in the ring. So he had the IBF title, lost it on the scale. It's not like the IBF comes around and... and takes the belt back as a fighter you buy the belt right so these sanctioning organizations when you win a title you buy that belt and that is now your belt so they don't come and take it from you if you lose a fight you have to keep that belt so i guess tank is just walking around carrying that belt like you know what yeah so rex i see rex's comment again here his follow-up comment he's walking around with his old ibf isn't that false advertisement yeah in a way but again the way they spin things and market things, I think his fan base really doesn't give a shit about that. In his mind, he lost that title on the scale. He didn't lose it in the ring. So he's going to rep that IBF title. Now, the real IBF titleist is Tevin Farmer, who we'll talk about here in a second. But that's why he's carrying that title around. Is he a unified champion right now? Hell no, he's not. CN asks, how much does the belt cost? It depends on the sanctioning organization. They're not cheap. Okay, they could cost hundreds of dollars. Some of these special, super duper, amazing belts that the WBC sells, they can cost over $1,000. They're not cheap. All right, let's talk about the rest of this card, guys. Look, for Javante Davis, I'll just say this again. Tremendous potential, okay? Tremendous potential. But he's not a superstar yet. And Floyd Mayweather, so Davis called out Tevin Farmer, after this fight and says he wants to fight him. I don't know if there's any interest really on his side of really doing that. But Mayweather said Davis versus Farmer is a pay-per-view fight. That's bullshit. It's not a pay-per-view fight. Like, Geronte Davis is not ready for pay-per-view, dude. He's not there. Not there. Okay, also on this card, your Yorkis Gamboa. All 37 years of him. KO2 win over Roman Rocky Martinez, who is 36 himself, but a much, much older 36. And we saw it. I actually thought this fight had potential, man. Uh, Martinez had, had not been active. He had no fights in 2017 and 2018. He was 3 3 and 1 for his last seven fights going back six years. But Gamboa, it's not like he's young. You know what I'm saying? Dirk Diggler's asking the Davis versus Farmer pay per view, and he's laughing. Yeah, Mayweather actually said that. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. Anyway, Gamboa is a year older than Martinez. And I get it. In boxing years, Martinez is much older. So, man, I thought this had the potential to at least go six, seven rounds and be entertaining. I thought this was going to be a fun co-main. It was Cuba versus Puerto Rico. And just with you know two older guys, their, their skills have slipped a little bit. But that's not what we got. We got a complete just one-sided beatdown from Gamboa who destroys Martinez and he might fight Gervonta Davis next. Don't shoot the messenger, but that's probably what's going to happen. I hate it. I know you hate it. That's probably what's going to happen next. 
Oh, we got a super chat from Harrison Property. Thank you very much, Harrison Property. He asked, do you think Tank will fight Loma anytime soon? I got two words for you. Hell no. <laughs> not happening, bro. Not happening. Thank you very much for the super chat, but that's not happening. Not happening at all. Um, look, Floyd Mayweather, Leonard L.O.B., they're saying a lot of things, but look at the action. Look at the way they've moved Tank Davis. They don't want to play ball with anybody else, and they seem to be in no rush to push that kid into a career-defining type of fight. Uh, it's, it's kind of sad, but no, I don't think he's going to fight Lomachenko anytime soon, and I don't think he's going to fight one of the other champions this year, possibly next year, but I think later this year it's going to be Yoriokas Gamboa, which in terms of name recognition will be the best opponent on his resume at that time. Let's see what else. Oh, Vince Cummings is on here. What's up, Vince? Gail Falkenthal's on here. What's up, Gail? Oh, yeah, Gail's saying that uh, fake Canelo walks around with his own WBC green belt. Yeah, so guys, th- there's a dude in the L.A. area who looks just like Canelo Alvarez, some Irish guy or something. He goes to all the fights, and it's so hilarious because people buy him beers and take pictures with him. And the WBC, to show you how invested they are in Canelo, it's a little, it's kind of scary at this point. It's almost stalkerish at this point. This dude has a WBC title, and I don't think he paid for it. <laughs> I don't think he paid for it. So anyway, uh, also on this card, Ladarius Miller ekes out a split decision win over Jazz Real Corrales at lightweight. Not a very good fight. Bullshit, yeah, just boring, hugging, grabbing. These guys, just their style sucked. Corrales docked a point, one point in the 10th round for holding. Now, here is where the referee, I think, went too far. Referee Brent Bovel docked a point from Corrales for holding in the 10th and final round of a fight that was full of holding and clinching and shit from both fighters. And you, you take a point with a minute or so left of the fight. And that one point cost... A draw. It would have been a draw if that point wouldn't have been taken. Now, look, I still think Corrales won the fight. Most people do. But the scores were 96, 93, 95, 94. And then one judge had uh, Corrales, 96, 93. So judges were all over the place. But again, without that point deduction, at least it's a draw. At least it's a freaking draw. But I just think overall, the referee should not have taken a point. That was where a, a case where a ref is overstepping his bounds. And changing the outcome of a fight in shitty scorecards really shitty scorecards all right let's go to arlington on the zone and so in the main event jose carlos ramirez improves to 25 and 0 with his tko6 win over maurice hooker his first professional loss uh look you guys know i picked hooker by decision i told you i was like 55 45 on it and i kept leaning more and more toward ramirez as the fight drew near i was like 51 49 the day of the fight but Ramirez showed levels. He showed levels that Hooker just doesn't have. And perhaps Hooker was a bit overrated. Perhaps Ramirez was a bit underrated. But you can't know for certain until a guy steps up. And Ramirez hadn't really stepped up and fought somebody like Hooker yet. So, uh, look, I did a poll on my Twitter page. And I asked you guys, how do you rate the top three at 140 right now? 40% of you said that you still got pro grade number one, Taylor number two, Ramirez three. And that's the way we're doing it at ring. We had an argument this weekend on the ring ratings committee as which way to go. And then at, um, at Boxing Monthly, we had pro grade, Ramirez, and Taylor number three. So kind of right in that r- wheelhouse. But both Boxing Monthly and Ring Magazine have pro grade number one. But 40% of you agreed. It's pro grade, Taylor, then Ramirez. 27% of you have Ramirez number one, Progray number two, Taylor number three, 33% of you other, which most of you guys in that other had Josh Taylor rated number one. Anyway, let's go back to this fight. First round knockdown was absolute bullshit. You guys saw that. And it was caused, referee Mark Nelson did a pretty good job in this fight. He screwed up that call though. It was caused by Ramirez jumping in, lunging in, in using these explosive movements with his feet. He was almost jumping and diving in at Hooker. And what I found interesting, what I did not expect, 
is that Ramirez's feet moved faster than Hooker's. And several times in this fight, Ramirez jumped in and landed on Hooker's lead foot, his left foot, and it caused Hooker to be off balance. And he stumbled a lot. And I'm, I'm surprised that the commentators just didn't see that, that the zone crew could do a better job noticing things like that, especially the former fighter, Sergio Martinez. He should see things like that. Now, to give him credit, he did see that Ramirez, Ramirez stepped on Hooker's foot in the first round for that knockdown. But just a minute or so before that, Ramirez had stepped on his foot and Hooker fell back into the ropes. And uh, Brian Kenny was saying, oh, Hooker's off balance. He said that several times in the fight. No, he wasn't. It's just that Ramirez was so much faster than him. He'd jump in and Hooker couldn't get back, get an angle quickly enough to get away from Ramirez's lead foot. So his lead, Ramirez's lead foot would get on Hooker's because his feet were faster. And you just... Going into this fight, you were told Hooker was the better boxer. But I'll tell you something. Ramirez has much better footwork. Hooker moves in straight lines. And another thing I noticed with Hooker, when he'd be at range and land a jab, it was really, really pretty. Oh, did I, did I say Sergio Martinez? Luis just corrected me. It's Sergio Mora. Sorry, guys, if I call him Sergio Martinez. That's hilarious. Uh, Sergio Mora, yeah. Uh, he should catch that kind of stuff more. But... When Hooker would land a jab on the outside, and he has freakishly long arms, and he would land that jab on the outside, and you guys are bashing Sergio Mora too much. <laughs> He's a nice guy. When Hooker would land that jab, he'd stand there. He'd just stand there. And R Ramirez was able to counter and cover up. And, and look, one of the first things you learn, boxing 101, especially if you're the taller, longer guy, after you jab, you push and you turn your opponent, Right? If you get off your left jab, you step off to the left, you do a quarter pivot with your back foot, you change angles. If you get a one-two off, you step over to your right and pivot, you change angles. That's how you spin your opponent. Anthony, my brother, is watching this. Remember when we were working mitts last week and I was showing you how to spin off, how to push off after getting off your combos? That's what Hooker should have did. He'd get off some ones and some one-twos and he even got some hooks in there, but he'd stand there. He wouldn't turn Ramirez. I think the secret to beating Ramirez is turning him. I think a boxer like Josh Taylor, who's very, very good at not... He's similar to Hooker in the fact that he's tall, he's rangy, he works behind a jab. It's a lot of ones and twos. It's not anything... The formula with offense is mostly ones and twos, right? And I'm... I know the British guys are going to get all over me. Hooker can, Mike Hooker can do a left hook. He can do an uppercut. I get it. But it's a lot of ones and twos, okay? So he's not exactly like Hooker, but it's similar. But Taylor spins and turns his opponent when he gets his combinations off. And that's one thing that Hooker didn't do. So um, that cost him big time in this fight. Ramirez had superior footwork. He had faster feet in faster hands. And he was moving forward. He was also giving angles. He was stepping to the side. He was getting to both shoulders of Hooker. Dug that left hook to the body. When Hooker started going, uh, looking for that left hook to the body and digging his elbow down, then Ramirez just started coming over the top with it. And that, that big sweeping left hook over the top is what changed the fight and caught Hooker backing up with his right arm down. And that was a product of the body work. And that's what changed the fight. And boom, in a flash, Ramirez jumps on him. Just combinations from hell. Referee Mark Nelson comes in and stops it. Proper stoppage. Um, you guys are bashing my British accent. No, no, no. Oleg, you're saying Hooker is not British. I'm talking about British fans in my comparison to Josh Taylor. I'm not allowed to criticize Josh Taylor in any way. So Josh Taylor, a lot of you guys have asked, how does Ramirez now do against Taylor? and pro -grade. I've thought about this a little bit. From what I've seen out of Ramirez, he looks better against taller, rangier fighters. Think about how he looked against not only Hooker, but Amir Imam. Now, he's gotten better since that fight. But Amir Imam is another tall, rangy kind of guy, right? He looks better against those guys than he does against the smaller, more compact guys. Think of how bad he struggled with Zepeda, who's five foot eight. Even a Roscoe, who he dominated, Roscoe had moments. He's five foot seven. Now, styles make fights, but body styles make fights too. And when you look at Taylor, he's 5'10, tall, rangy, 
ones and twos. You look at Progre, he's 5'8". He works in, on the inside with angles. So right now, I rate Progre and Taylor at one and two, and I rate Ramirez at number three. That's triggered people. I know a lot of people think Ramirez deserves to be number one right now. I hear you. I get it. But head-to-head matchup, just in the back of my mind, it's not that I doubt Ramirez anymore. It's that I'm so high on the other two. And when Pro Gray and Taylor fight later this year in the World Boxing Super Series Season 2 finale, it will be for the lineal championship because they are the number one, number two. Boxing Monthly sees them as the number one and number three rated fighters in the division. Whenever you get a number one and number two or number one and number three, that's a lineal championship. So that's what we're going to get later this year. Lineal, my favorite word. Lineal. Where's the ESPN crew? That's like their favorite word ever. So Ramirez... After that fight, after we see Pro Gray and Taylor fight, the winner of that fight is going to be the champion, and Ramirez is going to be the number one contender. That's the way I see it. And I can't freaking wait until he fights the winner of that fight. If that could happen next year, guys, 140 is one of my favorite divisions right now because these guys are fighting each other. I love it. For, uh, for Hooker, was he maybe overrated? Did we maybe, maybe overrate him? He got a gift against Darlis Perez in November 2016 on that first Kovalev Ward fight. Cian asked, was Bud lineal? Of course he was lineal. He cleaned out the whole damn division. But uh, Hooker, overrated. He got a gift against Darlis Perez a few years ago. Three draws in his career. Three like split draws, majority draws, right? So um, I don't know, man. I'll say this much. Jose Carlos Ramirez working with Robert Garcia. That shit's working. He looks improved. I don't know if it's the cultural thing or what's going on here, but um, I I think that they work together very, very well. He's able to get through to him, Garcia to Ramirez, and I think that that is a good union so far, and he's taught him better footwork and head movement and everything else. And they had a much superior game plan than Hooker and his team had. Their game plan did not look very good. It looked like they were outclassed, not just in terms of fighter, but in terms of corner. That's what I saw. Also on this card, Tevin Farmer bores the living shit out of the masses with the unanimous decision win over Guillaume Frenois, the French man to say. So he's not busy making baguettes and wearing a... Uh, what's the hat that they wear? I can't even think what the hat they wear. Uh, the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> French toss. While he's not busy doing all that shit, he got in the ring with Tevin Farmer. I'll give friend Wall credit. He was a tough guy, and he tried to win. He did not stop trying to win. The beret is the hat. Damn it, Gail. You, <laughs> Gail's always on point when I can't think of the words. My beret. I am eating a, a French toast, and I am drinking wine. I'm giving a cigarette to a baby. I'm making fun of Americans. Yeah, so friend Wall, my, my French accent is turning slightly Sergey Kovalev-esque. <laughs> Mike, you sounded like Borat. Yeah, that was almost a Kazakh French guy there. But <laughs> Frenois, he, he gave a very good fight for, for what he could do against Farmer. He never stopped trying. And I thought he actually won the last couple rounds. So uh, good for him. Farmer was booed after the fight, which, look, the fans in Dallas, probably a little tipsy. You know what I'm saying? Uh wanting action i I understand but don't boo the man don't boo the man that's his style that's what he does all right uh anyway farmer called out tank davis afterward he also said he was willing to fight burchelt even jojo diaz he didn't mention andrew cancio though why does no one want to fight cancio why He's on the zone. Farmer's on the zone. Make that fight happen. Farmer Cancio, tell me you guys wouldn't like to watch that. Again, I mentioned all the champions at 130. That division could be fun. It could be what we got at 140 if these guys would freaking fight each other, but they won't. And it's a goddamn shame. Now, on Sunday, July 28th, 360 promotions at a card from Hollywood, California. Sergei Bohachek improved to 15 0, uh, KO3 in the main event. All right, guys, so before I get to the preview, let's do some Q&A. Let's see some questions. Go ahead and get them at me, guys. Maybe I could do some more French Kazakhstan accents here. <laughs> uh, LR Chiga says, Concio style is dangerous for Farmer. I agree, but that's also why I want to see it. Look, 
Jose Carlos Ramirez, his style was dangerous for Maurice Hooker. But guess what? Maurice Hooker's got massive big balls. And he said, you know what? Let's do this. And they did a unification fight. So guess what? If Hooker can do it and Ramirez can do it, then Concio and Farmer can do it. Let's see. Andre Smith asks, what do you think about 135 Unified should be Lomachenko versus 140 champ. Andre, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking there. You might need to reword that. That looks like one of my tweets after I've had a few beers. Uh, let's see. I think you're asking, will Lomachenko unify 135 pounds? I mean, we'll see. Right here on the cover of this latest new issue of Boxing Monthly Magazine that's out, you see right here. Who's on the cover? Vasily Lomachenko, Luke Campbell. They're about to do a unification fight in the UK that will be on ESPN+. Plus. No pay-per-view. So Tank, guys, remember what Floyd Mayweather said when he said that Tank Davis versus uh, Tevin Farmer would be pay-per-view? Yet you got, in the United States anyway, I get it's pay-per-view in the UK, but here in the US of A, you get Lomachenko versus Campbell for three of the four titles at lightweight for $5. But Tank Davis and Tevin Farmer, that's, that's pay-per-view worthy. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Kento asked, Mike, which is worse, Novada, Pac-Man Thurman pay-per-view, or WBC clean boxing program covered white versus Rivas? Hmm. You know, I'm going to say that it's a more of a bad look, it is a worse look, for Pacquiao and Thurman to not have VADA testing. And they did do some minor commission level testing once guys like me kind of got in their ass with the questions. And other, like Boxing Scene and, and some of these other sites started reporting that there was no VADA. What I didn't like is people tied to that promotion trying to say that their fighters were enrolled in VADA testing. They weren't. There's a difference between the WBC clean boxing program and enrolling in full VADA testing. And again, if you guys would like to see a video where I break down the numbers behind the WBC clean boxing program, let me know. I will do that later this week because it needs to be done. There needs to be one video that you guys can go to with your boxing friends when they start saying, no, no, man, that fight had VADA testing. And you guys could just say, you know what? Here, here's a link. Watch this freaking video. This guy will explain why you're wrong. Let's see what else here. Henry Ford says, hey, I'm a big fan, Henry Ford. I've been to your museum. It's awesome. Only those of you in Detroit know what I'm talking about. He says, six-month vacation for Jarrell Miller and Dillian White, and it's back to business, LOL, joke. Well, look, number one, we can't compare Jarrell Big Baby Miller to, uh, to Dillian White. That's unfair. Jarrell Big Baby Miller had a cocktail of drugs, and we know for certain because Vada's process is great, exactly what was going on and that it was ingested knowingly. There's no way he accidentally ingested the cocktail of drugs he had in his system from various samples that were collected, right, at different times. And guys, that's another thing. When, when a fighter tests positive on, let's say you take two different urine samples two days apart and he tests positive on both of them, but the amounts are slightly different. You have to remember, if you collect a urine sample right when a f- fighter wakes up, their urine's concentrated. All the metabolites, everything in there is concentrated. When you take a urine sample two days later, and it's after a long workout where uh, you've drank two gallons of water, everything's diluted. So it is important to collect multiple samples, but also get them at multiple times of the day and at multiple stages of camp, and if possible, before camp. That's how this guy, Mr. Canelo Alvarez, tested positive for clenbuterol because VADA, unlike other testing agencies, the minute you sign that paperwork, they got a dude right there to collect samples. So you might not even, you might not even start training camp for two or three more weeks and they're there collecting a sample. And a lot of times that's when guys, if they are doing something, that's when they're going to test positive. Anyway, so look, dude, I don't want to compare Dillian White, who to be fair, Still going through adjudication, still figuring out what happened there. You know, let's be fair. Can't compare that to Jarrell Big Baby Miller. Can't compare that yet. Maybe down the road we will be comparing them and saying they're similar. Uh, let's see. 
Rockstar1996 says, supposedly White pays 40K for full Vada, but I won't vouch for him. I haven't heard anything like that. I can't say yes or no. <clears throat> oh, we got another super chat from Oleg Apatini. He says, will Tiffany Lamb consider getting a buzz cut? <laughs> Thank you for the super chat, Oleg. I don't think she's going to go for the buzz cut. I won't let her go for the buzz cut. Uh, also, it's L-A-M, Lamb, not Lamb. But she does get called Lamb a lot, L-A-M-B. She gets called that a lot. But uh, buzz cut. Hey, who, hey, you know what? You get her tipsy enough, maybe, maybe she'll do it, dude. So if we do a tipsy Q&A, watch that live with us. If you uh, pledge a super chat, maybe she'll do it. Who the hell knows? Maybe she'll do that thing where it's buzzed on the side, you know, that all the, like, the goth girls do, and they do the comb over. Maybe she'll do that shit. I don't know. That might work. That might be kind of cool. I think she could pull it off. LR Chicken said, white tested positive for ultra chase trace amounts. Miller is a pharmacy. Yes. To be clear, white tested positive for trace elements, metabolites of a banned substance. So basically, the banned substance uh, is in your system. It breaks down. He, traced it for, he tested positive for trace elements of the broken down molecules and all that. I won't get into all the half-life and all that crap. But that's what he tested positive for. Um, Derek Williamson says, you, I and Tiff should do the amazing race. That'd be fun. Are they still doing that show? That would be fun, man. John Gary Navita says, similar to John Jones. Yes, yeah, similar to John Jones, but John Jones is a known steroid cheat. He's just, he's done so much of this shit that the trace elements of it are just in his system. It's just there. So even if he, he'll probably test positive when he's 60. Seriously, maybe not 60. I'm exaggerating, but you guys see what I'm saying. Um, John Uden asked, Mike, is it true Herring wants his next fight at Camp Lejeune? John, when I talk to him, they're, they're talking about doing something like that. He thinks, he thinks it would be cool to do it on a military base around the Marine Corps birthday, which is in November. So that's what he'd like to do, but I don't know if that will happen or not. But there have been cards done for military bases before, like Fort Bragg, that's an Army base, uh, Lejeune. So that would be pretty cool. I think Friday Night Fights used to do that a lot. Gail Falker thought with a news flash from the PBC, Andre Berto has suffered an injury during sparring on Saturday, resulting in a torn bicep muscle and is forced to, with- forced to withdraw from his bout against Mikel Cruz this Saturday. You know what? You know what I say to that? <laughs> Thank you, boxing gods. And how many times is Andre Berto going to tear a bicep or a muscle? That is a dead giveaway that something crazy is going on behind the scenes. Hello, Vada testing. I'm just putting that out there. Uh, Look, I had no interest in seeing that damn fight. So, uh, good. Uh, You know, look, I feel bad that he tore a bicep. Yeah, Kevin Frey says, him and that torn bicep. Yeah, dude, how many times could he tear a bicep? That's a dead giveaway something crazy is going on. And he just continues to get opportunity after opportunity. Cian says, most overrated fighter ever. I wouldn't go that far with Andre Berto, but he certainly, he was basic. Think of and, um, Adrian Broner. I was going to call him Andre Broner. Adrian Broner is this generation's Andre Berto. Even though Andre Berto is still fighting, he's pretty much previous generation. The difference between Berto and Broner is that Berto is a true professional and trains and lives like a professional athlete. Broner is just an idiot. We got another super chat from Harrison Property. Dude, thank you so much. I love you, bro. Thank you very, very much, dude. Uh, He was asking, were you chasing an update with Triple G suing his management team? Any answers? Oh, I I was chasing an update with Triple G. Yeah, uh, Triple G was suing his former management team over a relatively small amount of money comparative to what he's been making the last few years. I think it was like half a million dollars or something. I don't have any updates, but you know what, dude? I, have, I will text Tom Loeffler tonight and ask about that just because uh, I'm recording on my phone right now, so I can't do it. But, j- dude, I will check into that, and I'll let you know. I'll, I'll hit up Tom tonight because uh, he's a few hours behind me, so it's early for him. So, yeah, after the show tonight, I'll text Tom and ask him and see what he says. All right. Uh, thank you very much again, Harrison Property. And uh, I'll let you know as soon as I get an update on that. So, all right, guys, quick preview segment. Uh, We have one less fight to preview. 
Thank you, Gail, for the news flash. I love it, guys. You can get live news here from the first lady, the real first lady of boxing media, Gail Falkenthal. That's pretty damn awesome. All right, Thursday, August 1st, we have a card on UFC Fight Pass from Pennsylvania. They also, UFC Fight Pass has a card from Vegas on Friday, August 2nd. Also this Friday, there's a Telemundo card from Florida. Knockout CP Freshmart, best nickname in boxing, defending, defending his WBA minimum weight title in Thailand. And we have a matchroom card from Liverpool, England, on the zone featuring Anthony Fowler and Lewis Ritson. Saturday, August 3rd, top rank at MTK are doing a card on ESPN Plus from Belfast, Northern Ireland, featuring Michael Conlon. Should be a fun atmosphere. But the only real big card this weekend is Saturday, PBC on Fox out of New York, Marcus Brown going up against Jean Pascal. Talk about a guy who shouldn't be freaking fighting. I don't know why he's fighting in this. Uh, and I think this is for Brown has a couple of interim titles and he's trying to line up a shot at one of the light heavyweight titles. Brown is 23 and 0, 28 years old. Pascal is 33, 6 and 1, an old 36 years old. And he's 4 and 4. His last four years going all the way back to the first fight against Sergey Kovalev. He fought Kovalev twice, remember. Um, going back to that first fight with uh Sergey in 2015. So Brown is 6'1", Pascal 5'10". Brown is uh, southpaw. Obviously, I like Marcus Brown big in this fight. He should, should stop Pascal. If he doesn't, eh, not the best look. But even if he doesn't, he probably will win a 118-110 type of decision. So um, now, heavyweight action. Adam Kovnaki going up against Chris Ariola. This has the potential for high action. Also has the potential to look like a fat, titty jiggling, gut jiggling version of Uriokas Gamboa versus Roman Martinez. Okay? Don't shoot the messenger. Has the potential to look that way. Why do I say that? Because Adam Kovnaki is 19-0, 30 years old, advanced age for only 19 pro fights, 6'3", 76-inch reach, weighs normally in the 260s for his fights. Ariola, 38 years old, a very old 38, not just old ring years wise, but old hard living in between fights wise, blowing up in weight, loves to drink. I remember covering one of Chris Ariola's fights at... Uh, Citizens Bank Arena in the Inland Empire. And uh, I, I shit you down. I've told this story a million times. After the fight, minutes after the fight, there was no post-fight presser. They, were, they just told us, go back in the locker room and you can interview the fighters. And we go back in the locker room and Chris Ariola is pounding beers, drinking beers in the locker room. Minutes after his fight. I can't remember which damn fight it was. Literally back there drinking beers and shit. Hey, you guys want a beer? Check it out, Holmes. You want a beer? And I was like, what? Literally, right there in the locker room. So, yeah, dude likes to drink. Anyway, Chris Ariola, 8-5-1, going back several years there. So, um, you know, yeah, did I mess that note up? Yeah. This is his third fight, only his third fight since the loss to Wilder in 2016. Hasn't been very active. So, um, yeah, I don't think I got that record right. My notes here are screwed up. But anyway, uh, generally speaking, same size as, uh, as Kovnaki, same height, same reach, maybe 20 pounds less, definitely hits harder. I think he's a harder hitter, but this could get ugly. It could be a lot of fun. It could be ugly. So that's pretty much it. I mean, I'll be watching because you guys know I love the big boys. And that's going to be fun watching, you know, a Polish guy uh, there in New York. Kamnaki has a, has a following there. And Ariola is a name. People know him. So, and he's got a lot of pride. So that should, I hope, be a fun, entertaining fight. Depending on the result, it might be time for Chris to hang him up. You know, we'll have to see. All right, maybe a few more questions, guys. And then we're going to jump out of here. Um, Gail says, I remember... That Ontario fight was against Curtis Harper. Name should be familiar. Harper is the dude who walked out of the ring against F.A. Ajagba. Yeah. Was that it, Gail? I, man, okay. I didn't know if it was the first Stavern fight. But yeah, there was, he had a few of them out there in Ontario. 
But I just remember, he's a super cool guy. He's just super cool, laid back. He'll have a beer and take a picture with anybody. And um, that's what's so cool. That's why fans love him. And then he's exciting in the ring. But at this stage, you know what I'm saying, going up against the young gun, this Polish kid can fight. And he's basically, uh, basically a twin of Andy Ruiz. He looks a lot like Andy Ruiz. Uh, same skin tone. They're both really pale. They're both uh, big, tall, fat dudes. Uh, I think Kovnaki has light eyes, though, and Ruiz has dark eyes. That's really the only difference. Other than that, they really could pass as brothers. They really could. Uh, they look so similar. Canada Chris asked, do you think there would be a World Boxing Super Series Season 3? Yes, I absolutely think so. Hamed92 asked, is hair testing effective in boxing? Uh, yes. And for what it's worth, it has been used in certain cases as part of an investigation, like what we saw with uh, the Canelo Clembuterol scandal. I've talked to Bob Bennett about this, and I've talked to uh, testing authorities at the world accredited labs, like, like in Utah and places like that. I've talked to people at VADA, like Margaret Goodman, about it. What's wrong with the hair testing right now is we don't have uh, all of the parameters set where WADA, the world anti-doping, they basically control everything for the whole world of anti-doping, right? They set all of the standards. They haven't said, well, if you, if you have, uh, how do I explain this? For blood tests, for urine tests, there are standards. There are certain thresholds for, you know, if you test positive for this much, then you're guilty. But if you're under this, you can slide, right? WADA sets that sort of protocol without getting into all the, nitty gritty of it, they haven't gone through that process. I use the word again. That, this will be the word of the show, adjudication. They haven't go, I don't even know if that's the right word for this, but they haven't gone through that process to determine what the thresholds and the standards for hair follicle sample testing are. And until they do, you're not going to see groups like VADA use it regularly because right now, if they used it, this would be the, and I've talked to them and they've told me directly, the fear would be legal action from fighters. Vada got, uh, had a lot of issues with uh, Alexander Povetkin and the, the, the Russian, his promoter, the authorities over there really gave Vada a lot of shit. And there was legal issues. You just, you don't want to leave too much open. Okay, so you, you, everything from a testing perspective, you want to have all your ducks in a row if you're the anti-doping authority and the standards have to be set by WADA before you can adopt certain testing. So until WADA gets all the hair follicle sample testing thresholds and whatever lined up, you're not going to see it very, very uh, often used in boxing or any fight sports. And that sucks. LR Chica says, red hair is hard to test, LOL. Yes, lighter hair and thinner hair is harder to test than darker hair and more coarse hair. That is true. But it's still legitimate testing. And see, that's also part of that whole process I was just talking about. If WADA sets the standards there, will the thresholds be different for lighter hair? Will it be different for uh, hair on the head versus the nape of the neck? That sort of thing. Because it, there are variances in the test results depending on the type of hair and everything else. So that stuff has to be worked out. As part of an investigation like what Nevada did with Canelo Clombuterol, they didn't look at it as a determining factor, the hair follicle sample, but they looked at it as additional information. What was in this hair follicle sample that we took? We test it, you know, check it out. What does that tell us versus what the urine sample showed versus what the blood sample showed? It's just more information. It's always better to have too much information than too little. So um, it is a good thing in that respect. But as a preliminary test and everything, it's just not there yet. The, the technology is not there. LR Chica says, I wouldn't mind Crawford versus Jose Ramirez. Well, as far as I know, Ramirez can make 140 pretty comfortably. And he wants the winner eventually between Taylor and Progre. But maybe when we get the winner of all that at 140, if it ends up being Ramirez, let's say he beats the winner of Taylor and Progre and is completely cleaned out and unified 140. Well, then a big fight for top rank and for uh, Bob Aram, Grandpa Bob, and Terrence Crawford would be Ramirez and Crawford. 
that would be pretty great at that point. That probably would be pay-per-view worthy at that point. You could make the argument. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you. You probably could. Uh, let's see here. Johnny Boy says, Michael Montero, hope the house is coming along. Well, my friend, been a while. Salute de Pazan. Thank you very much, Johnny Boy. It's coming along. Uh, still a lot to go. But it is, we're making big, big progress. So, uh, yeah. Got some bar shelves put up this week. So I'm able to start hanging up the uh, liquor bottles above the bar, which is pretty badass. Just little stuff like that is cool. Canada Chris asks, what happens to top rank after Bob Arum? It's going to stick around, man. They got management there that knows what they're doing. They're learning from the best. I think Bob Arum is the best overall promoter in the business. I think top rank does an outstanding job. And look, Nobody wanted to sign Jose Carlos Ramirez out of the Olympics. Nobody. He was an Olympian. Top rank saw something in him, and they developed him. He's had some bumps in the road, but now look at the performance he just had against Maurice Hooker, who more promoters were looking at. There were, I think it was Rock Nation first went after him. The PBC guys went after him. They all wanted Maurice Hooker. They overlooked Ramirez. Now look. I mean, Top Rank knows what they're doing. So they're going to be around for decades to come. All right, guys, let's see. Maybe one more question, and then we're going to jump off. Give, give, me, give me one more question, guys. I'll give you a few seconds here in the chat. All right. If you guys don't have anything, we're going to jump off here. Been going for about an hour. It's been a good episode, I think. Hopefully the stream has been a hell of a lot better DS Kennels 210 says Triple G in San Antonio. Possible. Possible. I think they'll go to Dallas before San Antonio, but it's possible he goes down to Texas. He doesn't want to go to Vegas uh, this September for his fight. It's probably going to be Mungia. And I think in Texas, it makes a lot of sense. Jose Mendoza asks, How is Castillo's son? Not sure. Not sure. Jose Luis Castillo's son is. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly what the injury was, but he's uh, in tough shape right now. I don't have any updates. I saw a post about it on boxing scene or something today, uh, but no updates. So as soon as we have something, I'll report it in news and notes. Gail Falkenthal says, reportedly Mungia is going to take Canelo's date in Las Vegas, who was the opponent. I don't know if, if, uh, if, Triple G fights Mungia in Vegas. You know, I, I'm gonna at that point I'm gonna call Gennady Golovkin a hypocrite because it's like, man, you bitched about Vegas so much and about your treatment with Canelo. So if Golovkin ends up fighting Mungia around Mexican Independence Day in Vegas this year, I'd have to call him a hypocrite at that point. I really would. But it'd be cool if Triple G and Mungia fight. Is that the best fight that could be made in the sport? Obviously not. Does it belong in Vegas? I don't think so. But I think in Texas, at that Arlington football stadium, it could be a big, big fight. But I just don't know if that venue is available then. Because I think at that point, uh, let's see, at that point you've got uh, football coming in. And Gail is saying that Mugia won't, won't fight Triple G. He won't be the B-side. Maybe Drevianchenko. Yeah, it's going to be something like that. It's going to be something like... Um, yeah, Triple G maybe against Derevyanchenko, but then again, Canelo apparently, they're talking to Derevyanchenko. I honestly, I don't know. I, I quit guessing on all this shit because I just can't keep up. Really, if Canelo would stop being such a goddamn diva, we should have Canelo Golovkin 3 signed, sealed, delivered, and being promoted right now for this September. And the only reason we don't have it is because of Canelo Alvarez. That's it. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, It's been over an hour. I thought it was a good episode. Remember, Twitter. Spread the word about the Twitter. Get some of your peeps to follow me. I'm trying to get that over 7K. And uh, let me know what you think about a video behind the scenes of the WBC clean boxing program. I think that could be a pretty informative video for some of you guys. And tipsy Q&A with Tiffany Lamb and myself. Uh, All right, guys. I'll see you at the fights. Have a great night.